Um, my name is Elizabeth Dinchel, and I am at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum in West Branch. Um, we are part of the National Archives. We're one of 13 presidential libraries. Um, there's no good way to start with this when we're teaching it. Um, I, uh, I give you a little bit of background on what this is. So we worked with the National Issues Forums. Have any of you ever used these in your classroom or, or done one of these in the community before? Uh, these are community deliberations that go out kind of around the country and um, I actually use these with students so some of them are missing their inserts. But they do these community deliberations around something that's important right now. So this past year was making ends meet, how should we spread prosperity and improve opportunity. Uh, the one that just came out is focused around community policing. And what we do is we have these discussions with usually 30 people or less. Um, when it gets bigger than that, it's not very good for discussion um, all the time. But because um, adults tend to talk a lot, students you will find if you do this exercise, do not. So <laughs> it's easier to do it with bigger groups of students. But inside they have these um, kind of like multiple choice answers and comment sections. And these go back to the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio. And then they put them into a study and they have nonpartisan lobbyists that go to Congress with this information and say, this is what the people around the country are telling you they want. Um, and for students, it's a really great way, especially if they're not old enough to vote, to have a say-so in something that might be affecting them right now. So like I did this with students all year last year, and they all got to give feedback to a lobbyist that went to Congress and said, you know, this is what we found around the country. So these can be really powerful, um, and we'll talk about these, but they've been doing the issues forums for several decades now, and they decided to take up historic issues guides. And so the pres the National Issues Forums, they're called NIFIs, um, and they're through the Kettering Foundation. And I'll pass these out, and you might have to share, but you guys can take them with you too. Um, and NIFI is on the bottom here for you as well on your teacher resource sheet. Um, they decided to kind of venture into historic issues guides, which is an interesting way to think about deliberation. Um, and we were part of that, and now it's expanding. Um, the Smithsonian is actually doing another Great Depression issues guide. Um, I just heard about that last week. But all of these historic sites from across the country are participating. So let's see. I should have brought my clicker today. Um, but this is just telling you it's the Kettering Foundation, and they're the ones that put their weight behind it and helped develop this um, all across the country. But we want to look at why deliberation is important. And now that we're getting the new standards in Iowa, they're kind of focused around the C3 format, right? And some of those components include deliberation, and some of them include informed action. And this can fill both of those roles if you use it right. And I know because I write lesson plans too, thinking about what to do for informed action is um, daunting. I, tend to think big, so I was like, oh, what could we do that's really big with this lesson plan? But it doesn't have to be big. Um, having a deliberation like this, filling out these surveys and sending them back to Kettering is a pretty awesome informed action. Um, so this kind of meets a few different, different needs in our curriculum building. But it gives us different perspective for how to solve a problem. Um, and it creates an atmosphere where we can let people discuss that without it getting ugly or nasty. Um, one of the things that we do as moderators is try to keep partisanship out of it, um, which is difficult, I know, in today's climate, but we can talk about that because the solutions that are offered in these books are issues-based, they're not party-based. Um, and it makes it easier to kind of dig into it. But one of the things that we talk a lot about a lot in the deliberations is trade-offs. Every time we make a decision to do something, there's always something bad that could happen, or we have to give something up to make something else happen. So a lot of times what I ask the students when they say, well, I think we should do this, I reply with, what is the trade-off? And they have to think about that. Um, even we talk about anything, any
anything we talk about. Tax breaks, running the buses more, um, not using plastic bags. There's a trade-off for doing all of those things and that has to be part of the discussion when we're making decisions. And it makes our students a little bit more prepared for dealing with dissent in discussions because they'll foresee it coming if they think about this is the solution and this is also the possible trade-off and I have to be able to argue for both of those things. Um, it asks them to prioritize their decision making too and you'll see why that is when we get into this a little bit but um, oftentimes when we're faced with a decision there's going to be losers in that choice and I hate to say it that way but there's definitely people who will lose out and so you have to prioritize needs of people or of businesses or of the economy some things over another thing and that comes that's factored into that decision making um, let's go to the next one. Maybe I should stand over here. Why can't we compromise? That's one of the questions we ask. Why can't we compromise on these decisions? And so these are created in this kind of triangle of tension, they call it. And the things that are in tension with each other are freedom, fairness, and security. And a really good example that they like to use for this is we take flying after 9-11, for example. So before 9-11, we didn't have to take our shoes off. Screening process wasn't as intense as it was now. But with that, we gave up security on our flights, and then we had an incident. And somewhere, our lawmakers and people came together and decided that they were going to compromise freedom and fairness for security. So they gave up their right to be searched at the gate, which is a constitutional right. And they also gave up their right to fairness because now you can be randomly searched. And uh, oftentimes people will tell you that the searches don't always feel so random. So we gave up freedom and fairness for secure flights on airplanes. They're regulated by the government. Um, TSA was added. So that's a really good example of why compromise sometimes doesn't exist in our decision making. And if you think back to other big decisions that happen, you can find this tension um, inherently in our decisions. So what do students do in the deliberative forum? So we kind of want to prep them a little bit for it. Um, there's a lot of reading involved in participating in a forum. Um, we want them to read the background. We want them to read the options and we need to give them time to think about it. When students come to do my deliberation at the Hoover, I send them all of this reading ahead of time. And as you can imagine, when I ask when they get here, who did the reading? I get like one hand. <laughs> so there's an easy way for us to kind of cheat on the deliberations too. Um, they build into them summary charts, which give us the kind of brief snapshots of what's going on, which is probably what we'll use today since you guys did not get to read them. But they get these different ways to look at them and the options are presented to them in the guides. Um, they have to exchange views with others. So we have ground rules that we give the students and one of the rules we give them is if you are used to dominating a conversation, don't. And if you don't usually talk, please talk. So you might have to kind of pull on your students a little bit. Um, I've found when I'm working in deliberations with them, I will walk right up to a student and say, what do you think? And make them answer me. <laughs> and sometimes it's harder than others, but typically they'll start, you know, they'll get going. Um, they have to weigh those benefits and trade-offs to making that decision. And they're gonna have to listen and reconsider. One of the things that they should do and we should instruct them to do is to come with an open mind. Even if you think something is the absolute right answer, listen to your peers because your mind might be changed, especially when we start talking about trade-offs to different approaches. So in the presidential decision making, it's different. It's different for a few different reasons. When we do community deliberations like making ends meet, we're asking the people what they think leadership should do, right? So that's, that power's flowing up. In presidential decision making, we're advising the president what he should do and his decision will affect all of the people below. 
So this is a power down decision that we're making. So these are two very different approaches. When we start talking about presidential decision making too, you'll see um, one of the options in our booklet is to repeal a constitutional amendment. Well, that's not easy. <laughs> and the president doesn't get to make that decision alone. So that gets factored into, is that a viable option for a president, uh, presidential decision making? Um, sometimes presidents find themselves in a crisis. In the other issues guides, um, Truman is faced with, do we drop the nuclear bomb? Um, George W. Bush Library just wrote an issues guide, and theirs is about how do we respond to 9-11. So sometimes presidents are faced with a crisis and they have to make an immediate decision to make things better. Sometimes it's a response. Um, I would say the Hoover Issues Guide is a response. They start seeing that unemployment is getting bad. Um, they're seeing that there's foreclosures. And now it's how are we going to respond to that? Um, it's not quite crisis level at the point that our booklet comes in, but it's definitely a response to things that are happening. Sometimes presidential decisions come off as aggressive because sometimes they're an act of war. Sometimes they respond with hard power. Um, and it's hard, I think, for um, students and, and even adults in these decisions to say the right choice is violence or a hard power response. Um, sometimes the presidential decisions are domestic. Hoover's is strictly domestic. What are we doing about the United States? What are we doing about unemployment? Um, but sometimes it's diplomatic, like the Truman Issues Guide, like the, the, the George Bush Issues Guide is more focused on how they're dealing with other countries. So as teachers, you're going to step in the role of moderator. And for people like me, we sat through moderator training with Kettering. Um, but that's not necessary to do the Issues Guides. And in fact, I would probably encourage you guys to be a little bit creative with these because we have so many um, primary sources available to this decision. So some of the things you want to do, the big one is to stay neutral. And it's really, really hard when you know the answer. Because in the historic issues guides, of course, we're asking students, like, what do they think the federal government should do to combat unemployment during the Great Depression? Well, we all know the outcome, but we can't let that influence the students because even if they think they know a little bit about the New Deal and even a little bit after that, they don't know enough to make a decision when they see the options that are given to them. So we have to stay neutral and not try to encourage them to pick what we perceive as the right thing. Um, one of the things that we do, especially in the community deliberations, like if we take a look around, there really isn't any people of color here, right? And if we were going to do the community policing deliberation, that would be a really important component of our deliberation. So one of the things the moderators like to do is introduce, they call it the empty chair in the room. And they pull a chair up and say, um, you know, we have to address the people that aren't here today. So if we were doing the Great Depression one, for example, we would say, well, what about that mother that's in the picture that's starving with her children on a farm? Uh, we, don't, we don't know what that's like. What do we think that she would want? Um, in the community policing one, we might say, like, our communities of color aren't present today. What would they say? Um, so we have to be cognizant of the fact that we are making um, democratic decisions and we need to think about the people who may not have a voice in the room. Um, this is the hard one, keeping the conversation respectful and on task. Um, I have found in a very interesting twist of events doing the deliberations and the, um, the advise the president guides with students, I would probably classify most of them as like libertarian anarchists. It's very funny <laughs> to catch their perspective. Like they think they have left or right views, but they have like extreme views. And um, part of that is that they just don't have enough life experience to kind of develop those opinions yet. And they'll really go after each other. So <laughs> you have to kind of tame it down a little bit for some of them. Um, some of them are pretty respectful. But one of the things that I noticed when we did Making Ends Meet was I had 
some students who are obviously kind of middle class calling out students who are poor and they were like well like i know that your family doesn't have money but my family has money and this is what we do and i was like whoa we're not going to talk to our classmates like that that's kind of disrespectful can we just kind of like get it back on task maybe talk more generally um so you'll have to kind of be aware <clears throat> of those things as they pop up because I don't even think they realize that they're being rude to the other student. So you'll have to kind of interject as referee uh, sometimes. So how do we spend our time? If you go to the Kettering website, um, the one that's on the bottom, the guide for moderators, they have these really great time guides that they use um, for the community deliberations. And you can kind of modify them for the advise the president ones. I think we're working on one, but it helps you fill in how many minutes you should spend on each section of your guide when you're working with your students. And it's really important to have a watch or a timer there with you. Otherwise, you will super run out of time really fast. And you want to make sure you get all the way through talking about options one, two, and three. Otherwise, you've got options one and maybe half of two, and you're trying to force them to make, make a decision. Um, but it has some like helpful tips here too, because sometimes we forget when we're far away from it. But it's just talking about trade-offs and being aware of you know, the person that's missing from the room. Um, one of the things it talks about is when we're in the deliberation, having, we call it a bike rack. Sometimes people call it a parking lot, right? Let's take that idea and put it off to the side for a little bit and we'll come back to that. Because sometimes they're talking about something that's an option three and we have to put it in the framework for them. Um, it also talks about inviting people who haven't participated and, and staying, on, staying on topic. Quick sure. I, you might have said at the beginning, I might have missed it, but the national issues, for those, you know, mm -hmm. are those, if you go online, are they accessible for free, like any of them? Or? Sometimes, sometimes you have to buy them. Um, they're, and I, I think it's like just at the printing cost for them, but they also do the forums online now too. So like if you had people that you wanted to participate with one of their trained moderators, they could do it online. I've done an online forum. It's not quite the same as it is in person, um, but yeah, they're usually for sale. Um, the advise the president ones are all available to download for free. So that website's on there for you guys too. Yeah, those are, it's awesome. But yeah, the issues guides, sometimes they have a fee associated with them. Um, so when you start off the forum, we do an introduction. Um, what is it? What's going on? We introduce the ground rules, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But we ask the students if they have a personal stake in the discussion. So like for making ends meet, um, that was an interesting one to hear students who have no assets or money of their own talk about how they feel like they're not impacted by economic anything because their parents are kind of well off. So maybe talking to them a little bit about personal stake and responsibility. I found that to be extremely interesting because my mother had shooed us all out of the house at 18 and didn't give us anything. So it was so funny for me to hear 17 year olds like, I'm fine because my parents have money. I'm like, well, okay then. So um, maybe talking to them about personal stake and how things affect them. Like some of the things they talked about in that issues guide were student loans and the ability to start a small business. Um, and they will most likely all be affected by student loans with the rising cost of tuition. So that's important stuff to talk about. But also finding out people who have a really deep interest in whatever you're talking about. Um, you'll spend time looking at the options, about 20 minutes each, and you want to make sure you spend <clears throat> equal time dedicated to each one of those options. Because part of the deliberation is the idea that we're going to give each one of these options equal opportunity and hash out those trade-offs and the good parts about it. And I'll tell you that it's surprising. Sometimes I've done this where I've gone to an option where students are like, Man, I don't really like that one. They don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it. And we spend a lot of time hashing it out, and they still don't like it. And then when we go to make a decision about which option we like the most, they end up revisiting that option that they didn't really like too much. So don't, 
don't think like you're doing a bad job. I, I think sometimes it, it percolates and when they get to all three options and it starts to come into context for them. So to advise the president and the community deliberation have a big difference in how we end the forum. In the community deliberation, they have that survey they fill out, we mail in, that's the end. There's no real resolution. Um, it's just sharing our ideas as a discussion. In the presidential deliberation, we have a reveal. We get to talk about what the president actually did do and who helped him make those decisions and what the outcomes were, which is really awesome because we've created or recreated the decision-making environment for them and then they get to see how it actually played out. And in the Hoover um, option, some of the options weren't great. So they really get to see how complicated decision-making is. It's not easy at all. And then there's real serious consequences when you make decisions, even when you think it's the absolute best decision you could make. So ground rules. Um, I write the ground rules on like a big, I have like big sticky post-it note things and stick it up on the wall uh, before we start every forum. Um, and this is what I use. Everyone's encouraged to participate. No one or two individuals should dominate the deliberation. The discussion should focus on the options. This is where we keep a lot of that partisanship nonsense out of it. We're not talking about what the Republicans did. We're not talking about what the Democrats did. We're talking about right now, this is an option that we can use to solve this problem. And so we can get them back on track with that. All of the major options have to be considered. So even if they look at option two and say, there's no way I want option two, we're still gonna talk about option two for 20 minutes. So get your thinking cap on, we're gonna do it. Um, we should maintain an open and respective atmosphere for the discussion. And that's where I'm talking about like when a student points out to another student that their family's poor, so this, you know, different. Like let's try to kind of pick at that and tell them not to do that. Um, everyone has to listen to each other. It's a really, really important part of the deliberation, and I think it's a skill that we're losing. I worked in oral history for many years uh, before coming to the archives, and about 95% of my job was sitting and actively listening to what people were saying so that I could develop meaningful follow-up questions. And sometimes when I get into you know, interpersonal conversations with people, they're not actually listening and they're already getting ready to talk over the person who's speaking. And so listening is a really good skill that we should work on developing with our students. And in this option, when I get to that, I tell them that it's important that we listen to the person, even if we disagree with what they're saying, so that we can ask them a question that highlights what we disagree on so that we can continue to have an open mind because maybe they'll change our mind. So be listening so we can have follow-up questions or so that maybe we can be persuaded too. Um, and it's okay to disagree, but do so with curiosity, not hostility. We're not debating. That's a really, really important part of this. This isn't a debate. So if someone says something we don't agree with, we can follow up with a question, but we're not gonna follow up with an argument. And that's really hard for students, and it's really hard for adults, too. So be thinking constructively about how we can disagree and follow up with questions instead of with targeted attacks at each other. All right, how can I help students weigh options deliberatively? So these are some of the questions we use that kind of help us get through the process. Tell me something you like and tell me something that worries you. That you can't pick an option that you just love and think that there's nothing wrong with it and that it will be perfect. Um, how might other people see this? And we've talked a lot about that, it's important. Um, is there any ways it can go wrong or be taken too far? And so a lot of these um, examples that we talk about with things being taken too far usually start with uh, a legislative action and end in the Supreme Court because somewhere along the line it got distorted and was taken too far that it violated the Constitution. So typically courts will deal with things that go too far, but if we want to prevent things from going too far, we need to look at things with foresight. So how could 
especially in presidential decision making, how could a decision be overreach or violate rights or go too far off the path? So that's something we have to talk about too. Whether you like the option or not, do you think it would make a major difference in addressing the problem? So this is another way we kind of get rid of that partisanship um, aspects of things. So, um, you know, if someone says, well, I don't want to give food stamps to people because, you know, they're all moochers and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's great. But do you think it would actually help to solve the problem? And so then they have to approach it from a different angle instead of just saying they don't like it because they think people are moochers. Now they're going to have to say yes or no, it might help you know, fix hunger in the United States. So they'll have to think about it a different way and maybe draw that out of them. And then there's always gray areas in decision making. And that's actually the best place for discussion. So, uh, you know, food stamps is one of the things we talk about in the Hoover deliberation. So, no, we don't like food stamps because it's a handout, but yes, it would solve hunger. So what do we do? Like there's this gray area of like, yeah, it'll solve hunger, but we don't want to make people, you know, dependent on the government. So how can we discuss that more and kind of hash that out? So those spaces are really good for discussion, but kind of at the end of the day, you guys know your classes really, really well. And like, I feel like I'm at a total disadvantage when I get students at the museum because I have no idea how they are in class and uh, doesn't always go go so perfectly well, but you guys definitely know your students and you know which ones will have really good responses if you draw it out of them or maybe which ones will say something a little bit edgier to kind of get conversation going. So definitely draw on those strengths of knowing your classes. So as moderators, we have to step back and do a lot of that active listening because we're not participating. So it's a really important thing to remember because even when people, I have teachers come to the museum, they try to participate and I'm like, no, no, you're observing. So as moderators, we are moderating and observing. We're not participating. So it's time to play devil's advocate. When is it time to play devil's advocate? When is it time to step in and kind of make the students um, have a better conversation? Um, if there's a lot of like-minded students, this actually makes the forum harder to do because they say, oh, I like option one. Yeah, 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 me too, me too, me too. So now we've got to like make them disagree with each other so we can have discussion. Um, but that goes the same way with everyone rejecting it. Uh, and, or saying like, oh, well, that's not going to work because nobody actually does that. Or we all know that doesn't work because of a modern example. Um, so is it time to argue for an option that's being dismissed? And that's like what I was saying. Sometimes we have an option and they're like, no, we don't like that. No, we don't want, and even all their discussions are negative about it. So sometimes we have to go back to that and kind of reevaluate that option. Is it time to point out those trade-offs um, and the difficulties? If we have students talking about, well, this is wonderful because, this is wonderful because, this is wonderful because, then we need to start asking them, what could go wrong? Whose rights could be impacted by this? Who's going to die in the streets because of this decision? What happens when someone comes back to the president and says, this isn't working because? So we have to start drawing the negatives out of them too, because it's not really a deliberation if they're only thinking about it in a very one-sided way. And that whole idea, again, of talking about the people who aren't in the, uh, in the room. This is my favorite question. How do I know if this is going well? Um, sometimes you don't know. And I've had students come in where I've basically fed them all the answers and been like, what do you think? And it's hard to get them going. Um, so sometimes it's not easy to know if it's well. But one of the top things, one of the top reasons I know it's going well is when someone say, says, all of these options suck. If all of the options suck, this is a really good forum because that means they've thought about why they're good and why they're bad and they're really equally weighing these options in their minds. And it does suck because everything comes with a trade-off. So I hear that in almost every deliberation. Well, these all suck. 
yeah, well, the situation sucks, so we got to deal with it. Um, and that they're considering those ranges of views. So they're talking about things maybe that they wouldn't normally um, talk about. They also personalize it and talk about what's important to them. Um, I recently did the Making Ends Meet um, deliberation with a community deaf club in town, and it was the most eye-opening deliberation I'd ever done because their personal stake was so deep in this because they feel like they've been left behind by society, they're not given equal economic opportunities. A lot of people depend on the social safety net who were deaf. Some people were deaf and blind and really depended on the social safety net. And they had very wonderful discussions and deep, meaningful discussions about how this impacted their life. And it was so amazing for me to see as a moderator um, this group of people that's so profoundly impacted by social, um, the social safety net and how important it was to them that it changed the way that I moderated that debate when we talked about the people who weren't in the room. So um, when people start personalizing it, then it's really getting real in the room. Um, I talk about when we do the Making Ends Meet and the Hoover deliberation too, that my family had depended on the social safety net uh, for many different reasons throughout our life when I was growing up. And so there's a lot of people impacted by that, um, even kids who get free school lunch. And so I tell them, if you get free school lunch, you know, you're also a recipient of that. So, you know, keep that in the back of your minds too. Um, but disagreements are coming out, but people are looking for understanding and they're working towards common good instead of individual good which is really, really interesting to watch the students because remember I said they were like, kind of like libertarian anarchists? This is the part where they only start talking about themselves. That's how they all start. Me, 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 me. And then by the end they're like, oh, well, but other people. And it's like, yes. <laughs> so getting them to look at that common good as a bigger thing than just how things impact themselves. So ending a forum is actually a really sad thing, especially in the community forums, because there's no resolution. Um, it's a current issue. We're handing it off and hoping something happens. And it just kind of feels sad when you're done with it. Um, in the presidential deliberation, you read about what actually happened. And if you advocated for something that failed miserably, then you feel kind of bad, too. So um, the forums are are kind of sad to end and people are like the students are really riled up from them and I feel like I don't know how teachers teach all day I used to do it a long time ago but now I don't at the end of doing a forum I am like mentally wiped out it's exhausting to do one I think too um, but we start looking back at reflections with the students too there's individual reflections and there's group reflections but how has your thinking changed about the issue? It's kind of a big question. You know, did you come in with one opinion and leave with another? Um, has your perspective changed? Can you see things maybe from the person who wasn't in the room? Can you see their perspective now, now too? Um, group reflections. Did we not discuss something? Was there something we wanted to discuss that maybe we put on the bike rack that we didn't get back to? Um, can we identify any shared sense of purpose? Uh, and that's really important because even just in general civics discourse now, I think this is something else we talk about missing is feeling like this shared purpose um, amongst discussion groups. Did we discover common ground? Were there trade-offs we're willing to accept? Like if we say there isn't going to be food stamps because we don't like that, are we willing to accept that some people are going to die because they don't have food? And like, were we cool with that? Like, let's discuss that out openly. Um, and, you know, what things were we willing to accept? Sometimes we learn things about ourselves in this process as adults, really more so, I think, with the students. Um, they start to understand that some students have a really great sense of community. But I would say, like, half the students don't. They really live kind of in a bubble. And this really gives them some eye-opening experience. And then even as a teacher thinking about, like, is there things we want to follow up on? Do we want them maybe to 
write a paragraph or two about how they felt about this, um, maybe if there was viewpoints they didn't disagree with and why or why their minds changed. It's a really good kind of creative exercise. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at our own presidential deliberation, which is always a ton of fun. So let's see. Time is it? Ten o'clock. Awesome. I am going to. I think I have enough copies of the deliberations. If not, we might have to share. Let's hope not. So, what I want you guys to do is start looking at the deliberation and the context and framework for it, and I'll kind of walk you guys through a little bit of it, um, so we can set up the time period, things like that. All right, we're definitely going to run out of these. All right, so you guys are going to share. Yep. You guys might have to partner up and share over there. Let's see, I think we're going to have to share. There's three of you, so I think you're going to need two. Do you guys have one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Let's get a couple to you guys to share. You might have to partner up with someone. Man, I made a lot of these too, usually. All right, oops, sorry about that. Looks like I've got enough to kind of pass some more around, so. Here, I might actually have enough to get some extras out. Yay, there we go. Yep, you could. You're gonna. Ha you can take them with you. Um, the beautiful ones that come out um, from uh, the presidential libraries look like this and have documents and presidents in them and stuff. But ours is literally fresh, hot off the presses. We, they just finished the um, design work for them, and I think they're going to print. I think it's this week because I'm taking them to the Truman Institute with me. So um, yeah, they're. Brand new, so you guys just get the uh, Word version for right now. But it will go up on the website. Yep, and these, this, versions of, this version of it is in the um, Google Drive, too. Um, the website is www.advisethepresident.archives.gov, and it's on your teacher worksheet. But it has, so there's deliberations for, and they're in the Google Drive, too. Clinton, Truman, um, Reagan, who else do we have? Eisenhower, and then there's three more coming out. Bush, us, and there's another Clinton issue guide coming out. So there's several to choose from um, that are coming out, and there will be more rounds of these coming out. But it takes like two or three years to write these, so it's a long drawn out process. There's lots of research that goes into this. So I'm a historian and I had a really, really hard time doing this because I was like, well, history already happened. Like, how do we go back and ask people what they think about something that already happened? So I had a lot hard time um, kind of grappling with it. But once I understood it better in my head, I thought it was easier. Um, so in this, this guide, it's called, How Should the Federal Government Fight Unemployment During an Economic Depression? And we're looking specifically at the Great Depression. And kind of the context for this is that we're not asking what states should do. We're asking specifically what the federal government should do. In this case, we're telling the president how he should conduct agencies and federal business to deal with unemployment. And I know a lot of us are kind of familiar with um, what's going on here, but this very first page. And I also tell the students, too, like, even if you know what happened, we're going back in the time machine. 
let's not talk about what happened. Let's talk about like we're in 1929 right now and we're faced with decisions. But less than two years after his landslide election, President Herbert Hoover is facing arguably the greatest economic crisis in the nation's history. Following the stock market crash in October 1929 and the subsequent aftershocks in the national economy, millions of Americans have lost or are afraid of losing their jobs. President Hoover is seeking advice and remedies to assist the estimated 3.4 million Americans facing unemployment to prevent unemployment in future economic depressions. In this time of crisis, the president needs to hear the ideas of all Americans, along with consulting with his cabinet, congressional leaders, prominent business figures, and charities across the nation. After lengthy deliberations, the president has three options he would like to discuss with the principal advisors, including you, in order to respond to the unemployment situation. The intent of this meeting is to discuss the options for consideration, evaluate the consequences of each option, and select the best course of action for the American people. And so I like to lead off with, with my students. We have this great letter that comes from Congress, and it says, the unemployment situation is the most serious problem that has confronted our country during the 12 years I have been a member of Congress. There are practically 3 million men and women out of employment. Improved machinery and labor-saving devices have increased production and very materially decreased labor. We don't still hear that argument, do we? <laughs> And then it goes on to talk about supply bills. I therefore urge that Congress be convened at once in an extraordinary session to consider this most important problem so that some solution may be had. So this is a procedural question right off the bat. Who has to call for a special session of Congress to address an issue? The president. We know Congress is backing him up and asking for a special session of Congress. They want to work on it and be cooperative with the president. So we can start off knowing that whatever we talk about, we at least have Congress's ear and they're willing to work with the president and they're willing to work in a special session as well. So we start off there and there's something else that's interesting that I like to look at too. We get this awesome telegraph. So in 1929, there's no computers, there's no real methodical way to collect statistical information at all. So what the president's relying on is for governors of state to report back unemployment numbers at the state level. And so we get this letter from the American Red Cross or telegraph from the American Red Cross to the president. No one has accurate unemployment figures since Employers Association stopped publishing figures last year. Estimates vary from 40,000 to 100,000. This is just for Detroit, by the way. Uh, 40, uh, families have used $40,000 in relief in December. The record was 9,000 families and $400,000 in January. So Detroit is having serious issues and they don't even know their real unemployment numbers. And we start to find when we're digging into the president's um, information too, that he doesn't have real numbers either and nothing consistent coming in from governors in the beginning. Why do you think that governors would have incentive to lie about unemployment figures? So they can get reelected, exactly. So we have governors fudging numbers that are being given to the federal government because they don't want to look bad. Because no one understands the totality of the unemployment crisis that's impending. The, I think that the governors were probably aware that it was creeping up in their states, but they didn't realize it was going on in so many other places as well. So I want to give us about 15 minutes for you guys to look through the front of the issues guide. There is background that you can kind of thumb through, but the important parts are um, pages 7 through 7 through 13, because those are the three options and the narrative that goes with them. Um, and on the other side, for our students on page six, there's a glossary of terms for them because we found there were some things that 
maybe they didn't understand like what a tariff was or appropriations, deflation, the economic policy of laissez-faire. So there is a good glossary that is written in here with a timeline of things that have happened too. But yeah, we'll spend about 15 minutes doing that. Um, and maybe if you, know, you wanna go to the restroom before we start in our deliberation, this would also be a good time. So at 10.30, we'll dig into our deliberation. All right, I'm a believer in starting back on time, so we'll do that. Remembered I had my win with Hoover pin, so I got that on for the spirit of Hoover. Did you already find yourselves reading the options and saying like, oh, I know what happened, like we should do this because this is what actually happened? We probably all did. That's okay. And actually, I hope to kind of pleasantly surprise you because Hoover has a lot more depth than he actually gets in textbooks, and he actually, um, is responsible for a lot of things that we typically assign uh, to FDR for credit. Um, and in fact, it's been fascinating watching um, this first 100 days of our president versus the 100 day, first 100 days of FDR and Hoover because Hoover had started a bunch of stuff that couldn't get passed and then FDR signed executive orders for them and gladly accepted credit for them. So it was a complete opposite um, but um, surprisingly I got to talk about this last year at the Truman Institute before we even had our our general election um, FDR and Trump campaigned very similarly does that surprise any so FDR spoke in like very vague terms about how he was going to solve all these problems but he didn't have a plan and he wouldn't reveal it to anybody and he didn't really have a stack of advisors that were willing to help him but um, people hated Hoover so much that they elected an FDR with like a lot of dreams and not a whole lot of plans. Um, and eventually he was able to start executing on them. But in a very similar manner, he had to start doing executive orders because there wasn't really a legislative way to get his things through. So um, I think looking back, maybe in the next decade or so, we'll be able to make a lot more parallels between those um, those two presidents, which is fascinating because they're so, so totally different. But um, definitely look at it. It's, it's interesting stuff because we were talking about campaigns at the Truman Institute um, last time. And I got to talk a lot about Hoover and throw a lot of shade on FDR before my FDR uh, counterpart from um, the FDR library went, so that was fun for me. Because, <laughs> of course, it's so weird working at a presidential library. I just want to tell you this. I... I was an American historian. I didn't have a whole lot of opinions about Hoover. I knew a little bit about Hoover, not as much as I know now. Um, but I had worked with a professor that went to Princeton and was taught by author Arthur Link, who was taught by Woodrow Wilson. And so he loved Woodrow Wilson, and we spent a lot of time talking about Wilson's time period, and then a lot of time talking about FDR's time period. He had written a lot of books about FDR and executive orders and court processes and stacking courts and uh, stuff like that. But um, I came in thinking I was probably really gonna hate Hoover, and it's amazing how working in a president's documents will make you appreciate the human element of who they were because we lose that when we experience a president firsthand. Um, and I think that's why, as Americans, it's easy for us to like reflect fondly back on presidents from a long time ago. Like Woodrow Wilson was kind of a scary president, and he had a lot of like dictatorship qualities. But we look, people look back kind of fondly on Wilson now. It's, um, it's interesting how history shapes our opinions of people. But hopefully you'll be surprised by Hoover. Um, he really was a, a humanist and, and he believed in goodwill and altruism and a lot of other things that really didn't pan out the way that he thought they would. So first things first, we're looking at now, and I heard someone talk about it in the beginning, there's no social security, there is no food stamps, there is no welfare, there is no way to pull yourself up by bootstraps and have some government assistance in 1929. It does not exist. So any of those solutions are gonna have to come from us. We can't, you can't just think, oh, well that person could go get food stamps. There are no food stamps to just go get. 
So keep that in the back of your mind as we're um, talking through the options. And if you get to an option that you know that you don't like, especially if because you like uh, the ability of history teachers, we can look back and say, oh, that's not what was decided. Think about how we can be more inquisitive about that because we're going to have to guide our students through that same process that we're going to go through right now. So we're going to start off. Um, we know the ground rules because I talked about them a little bit. We're not going to debate with each other, but I definitely want you guys to talk to each other. I am here to facilitate. I don't want to lead the discussion, but I will kind of interject and maybe prod to get you guys going. So sometimes my teachers are as bad as students and don't talk. Don't be those teachers today. Let's try to talk to each other and have some conversation. Um, make sure that we like give people the opportunity to talk and we're doing that, you know, don't dominate the conversation uh, kind of thing. And try to listen. Try to be active listeners today and think when you disagree with someone what kind of question you would want to ask them about their position, even if it's, you know, well, if we do that, then we have to do this, and are you okay with that? Um, because we're talking about those trade-offs and thinking about that. So we're looking at what we should do about unemployment during the Great Depression, and to let you guys know, as instructors, when I came into this, I'm like, I have no idea what topic we're gonna choose and how we would decide how they made decisions. We decided on the Great Depression because it was so, have, it's such a big focus in curriculum, and I wanted to make sure this could be used in our classrooms, but I didn't know how we were gonna frame it. We came in with just the Great Depression, and I spent the better part of maybe 10 hours a week for two years in the archives researching until we were able to hone in on the topic of unemployment specifically because it was manageable. But then also finding, and we'll look at some of these, but all of these primary documents, letters from people, letters from economists, letters from congressmen, um, letters from ambassadors, cabinet members that all gave us clues about how the president was going to make these decisions about dealing with unemployment. So we didn't just make it up. Um, there's primary document support evidence for all of the options that are presented. Some things were things we didn't even think about because at first we said, yeah, 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 let's do unemployment because that's what people were writing about. These are what we think the three options should be. And as we started digging into what the president was faced with, we discovered a whole bunch of things we didn't even think about, like repealing the 18th Amendment. Never occurred to any of us, but it was really on people's minds at that time. Um, all of these pr uh, primary documents are in that Google Drive for you guys as well. How many of you use Docs Teach in your classroom? A few people. So if you haven't been on Docs Teach, it's on that teacher resource page. The National, <laughs> I say this so lovingly, the National Archives is not easy to research online. It's not, it's just not. I work there, I've been a historian for a long time. I can't find stuff that I've added to the National Archives catalog. So um, docs teach, we actually go through and we pay teachers and we have education specialists and interns and we basically curate documents out of the National Archives and we write really good descriptions, we give them keywords, we plug them into time periods Docs Teach is so easy to use. You can do like Google keyword searches, and it's even good for students to use to look up documents. I love Docs Teach, like love, love, love Docs Teach. And I um, had a poor history intern and an education intern that worked on nothing but adding Great Depression documents to Docs Teach for two years. We added 2,000 documents about the Great Depression the docs teach, and they're all important. So they're not just one that you read and go, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. They're letters from people about how they were suffering during the Great Depression. They were letters from people asking for help from the president. Um, they're these kind of letters that we're gonna talk about that gave the president advice. Um, one of the things that I thought was so surprising about Hoover, um, Hoover, had never held an elected office, kind of like President Trump. <laughs> the last president that ever never held an office was Hoover. Um, and he refused to take advice 
from economists that were writing him letters. They were like, I am this economist from Harvard, and this is what's going to happen if you don't do X, Y, Z. And then he'd get a letter back saying, I assure you nobody knows more about the economy than President Hoover. And who he was taking advice from was engineers, because the people that elected him said that they wanted him to run the government with, like an engineer, with scientific you know, precision, and that things would run more smoothly and more scientifically. Didn't work. Um, but it's interesting to see how, who they took advice from and who not. But we digitized a lot of those letters from those economists and got that into Doc's Teach because a lot of them were very um, good at predicting what was going to happen. And I don't know if the solutions that they presented were great. A lot of the economists didn't offer solutions. They just said, if this keeps happening, this is what's going to happen. This will be the outcome. And that's probably like within the realm of their, their study, not so much legislation and how to fix it. Um, but also now we know, looking back, the Federal Reserve played a large part in what happened as well. So. Um, these letters and, and the, there's more documents that are there. I suggest everybody look at Docs Teach. Docs Teach also gives you the opportunity as instructors to build document based lessons and activities. You build a classroom inside Docs Teach, you can assign it to your class with a link, and when they finish it, they submit it to your classroom as completed. And they have really great activities like weighing the evidence, putting documents into sequence. They have um, sort of kind of DBQ type questions too, not as big as like an AP uh, DBQ, but some of them are like, here's one thing I want you to focus on, tell me what it means, and then they give them the rest of the document to put it into context and, and shape their ideas differently. Um, there's options for photograph activities. It can really hit a swath of ages. And also if you're not using them on Docs Teach and on NARA's um, education website, there's document analysis sheets, and they have them at two levels. They have one document analysis sheet now that's really good for ELL students and for younger students. And then they have document analysis sheets that are for older students. And basically, we're training our students to look for those things that we already look for as historians, like, you know, is there a letterhead? Who was the letter to? What year is it? You know, who signed the letter? What's the context of it? You know, thinking about audience and um, things like that so that they don't just pick it up, look for the answer, and, and leave the document without fully understanding what it means. And our hope always is that it's training their brains to think like that so eventually they don't need those document analysis sheets, but they have them for every type of primary source you can think of from maps and music to political cartoons to letters, um, newspapers. It's really a great tool. And I have to admit that the Federal Reserve has a wonderful um, site on using political cartoons for teaching, and that's really important in the Great Depression, and so does the Library of Congress. So just a heads up on that. So we look at the options that are presented, and they're interesting, right? <laughs> and think about how they're in conflict with each other, that there's going to be people who win and who lose in these options. But let's take a look at option one first. And option one asks us, whoa, that marker is awful. We cannot use that. Let's try this one. These are all bad. This is why we need smart boards everywhere, right? So the first option we're presented with is to reduce the economic role of government. When Hoover came into office, his Secretary of Treasury was a man named Andrew Mellon. You guys might remember reading about him in here. But Andrew Mellon's advice was that there was a panic in the 1800s. There was a pan there were several panics in the 1800s. And we came back from them without doing anything. And as soon as we get involved with tinkering with the economy, we mess it up. So we leave it alone. It self-corrects. The market will self-correct 
And people that have too many assets will liquidate them, put the money back into the economy, and that will kickstart it and get it going. His nickname was a leave it alone liquidationist. He said, if you just leave it alone, people will liquidate their assets, the money will come back in the economy, it'll be fine. So um, this is one of the options that are presented. And we get some of these um, options and letters to Hoover that say, um, you know, we're, we're in a period of deflation and there's already vacant buildings. As soon as the economy gets kick-started, there'll be a surplus of commodities and everything will be fine. Profit and good times will return. And people were writing him this stuff. And, and this is from an engineer. Remember we talked about engineers being the person that Hoover liked to trust because he was an engineer. And so they were advising him to leave stuff alone. It'll come back on its own. Um, and, and that seemed to be a pretty common um, kickback. So you guys have, if you flip to page 10, you get these kind of charts that give us suggestions of things that they could do to deal with option one. Um, and I'll kind of get us kicked off. We can talk about reducing spending as one of those things. Reduce spending and balance the budget. Now back in Hoover's time, the government was about, um, I want to say, I want to say the exact figure is it was about 10% the size of the government currently is today. It was 90% smaller. And the budget reflected that very well. Um, so at this point, balancing the budget is about keeping confidence in the American dollar. Um, and for teachers, for you guys to know as an aside, something I wouldn't talk to students about, Hoover did something to ensure that we weren't manipulating currency. He held the United States dollar to the gold standard, and he would not allow for inflation to occur. And that way, people would continue putting money into American markets, because all around the world, markets were collapsing. Some of it was the fallout of World War I and reparations. But it wasn't just happening in the United States. It was happening everywhere. And inflation was out of control in countries like Germany and um, Great Britain. So Hoover thought if we held to the gold standard, then businesses would continue doing business with us. We wouldn't have an inflated currency. And our economy would hold strong. So that was part of some of the stuff that he was doing. Um, and he wanted to avoid that currency manipulation. But um, part of that was involved in that balancing the budget and um, reducing economic role of government by making sure that we just held to the gold standard so our money was real money, was their thing. They wanted real, real money. So if we reduce spending, what are some things that we can do to reduce spending? As a government, thinking federal government. What kind of projects do we use government money for? Defense. Defense, especially coming out of World War I, right? What else? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. If we reduce spending, um, in defense and infrastructure, are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable? We're just coming out of war. Are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable and are we willing to sacrifice um, infrastructure? Well, so what infrastructure were we building then? Because the interstate highway system is in the future. Well, there were still local roads, but post offices were federal. Uh, a lot of schools were still federal. Um, even air traffic control at that time, which we still knew was federal. Um, well, of course, anything defense-oriented was, um, was federal as well. There's still some things that are starting to pop up in Hoover's time, because cars were still pretty new at this time. But um, the National Transportation and Safety Board has been born and coming to life. So things like traffic signs and traffic signals are coming mandated down from the federal government. Um, definitely air traffic was a big one that, apparently there's still some laws on the book that people, books that people don't like to work for. 
But there was, um, yeah, communications were all federal, radio, uh, radio waves, and radio infrastructure was government. That's how they kept control over it. And if you don't know, that's still a thing today. That's why we have the FCC. Um, trains? Train, well, yeah, trains to a certain degree. Post office, um, defense, I'm trying to think. There was some other smaller agencies that the VA was started to crop up. The inspection act of food and drug. Yeah, food and drug starts coming up. This is where the, the government starts to get larger, is in this time, um, when we start coming into more regulations. Um, and part of that was Hoover as the Secretary of Commerce, which is funny because it's kind of the opposite of his political beliefs. Um, so yeah, there is some, definitely some infrastructure that, that can go back on it. Um, but of course, the second big one is to cut taxes, right? So what happens if we cut taxes? What do you think about trade-offs for cutting taxes? Less initial money for the government, but possibly more if the people that are employed spend more of that money and put it back into the economy. But it requires enough people to be employed. What are some good things about cutting taxes if we're looking at balancing the budget? What about for businesses? What good things happen for businesses when we cut taxes? They need more Is there anything else we can think about that maybe businesses might benefit from cut tax, uh, cutting taxes? Kind of goes with jobs, but they could expand. I mean, if they don't have to pay taxes, they could uh, focus profit. on increasing profit. Put money into their business. Purchase expand. Mm -hmm. And I see the less revenue as being more of a short term yeah. issue. I mean, if the economy comes back, then you go with lower taxes, you're going to have an increase in revenue over time. Businesses are making more and the economy is expanding. Well, the flip side to that, though, is that if this is a kind of an un, unexperienced phenomenon before, the businesses could get scared. People could and try to retain the money. And not hire people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and then not want to expand. In the same way people, they might just be shoving money under the mattress instead of going out and spending it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they spend the extra money that they have. Which would be likely since they've never experienced this. Never. So they don't know what a future holds. No, but there have been other depressions and panics before that everything's weathered fine. So most people are afraid by this. Because remember, we, we can look back and say, oh, this is the Great Depression. But many people thought this was going to be far less severe than the Panic of 1898. And so... What kind of taxes are we cutting here? Across the board, we'd be advocating for tax cuts. Um, and really, there was a high percentage of business tax and this corporate taxes were, were coming into play right now. No income tax. tax rates. No, no, income income, no federal income tax yet, though. Yeah, that's something important to think about. No federal income tax yet. But there was definitely sales taxes and other uh, taxes. And, the tariff, which we'll talk about later. There's some other stuff going on. If we think about reducing economic role of government, um, is there anything else you guys can think of that's maybe not even in here that um, would signify the government is removing regulations off of the economy? Deregulation in general, deregulating business. Any congressional laws to deregulate? Regulating the banks. Yeah. So, what good things happen when we deregulate businesses? <laughs> they get really rich. Right. <laughs> they become very creative. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Paramilitary groups see more jobs. 
Can they hire more people at a lower rate? Yeah, and then you have the rise of unions. So this one's interesting because it's not modern to us. It was something that didn't occur to us when we wrote the guide. But we're repealing the 18th Amendment. Yeah. Um, I, it's a super interesting um, thing. And um, we got, there was tons and tons and tons of letters about it that came into to Hoover about why are we still regulating alcohol uh, when we need jobs? And they were talking about basically introducing a whole new industry back into the economy with um, repealing the 18th Amendment. And so this one's procedural. So repealing the 18th Amendment sounds easy, but how difficult is it really to appeal to repeal a constitutional amendment? It takes a form of two houses of Congress and all the state legislatures. A percentage of the state legislatures you have to put it before all the state legislatures. Three quarters. Three quarters. What good things come out of repealing the 18th Amendment? Business. Lots of businesses, more jobs. Possibility have to buy vehicles. Tax, tax, tax alcohol. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Reduced prisons. Oh, yeah. That's true. Less the declogs like the legal system. I know like half the legal system was. That was one of the things we forgot alcohol. to talk about up here uh, with taxes is we are paying for federal law enforcement and the FBI to enforce prohibition laws. Um, especially because we saw a rise of mobsters um, in different parts of the country. So we could reduce, that would reduce law enforcement costs. It costs. brings the entire chunk of money out of the black market into the actual market. What are the bad things that ha what are some of the trade-offs if we repeal the 18th Amendment? What's some of the bad stuff that could happen? Law-abiding citizens who were purchasing alcohol now stop spending on other goods and they start purchasing alcohol again. This decreases their productivity because prior to this, there was the, the Saint Monday that people got so drunk on the weekend they'd always take the Monday off. <laughs> Domestic issues well, so there's definitely some trade-offs to repealing the 18th Amendment as well. It's interesting because your kids will be like, I can't see anything bad about repealing the 18th Amendment. <laughs> So well, you, you might can, have you to can, walk them through that a little bit. You could compare it to legalizing drugs today. That's what I do. Yeah, well, some of the some of the people are like, don't you remember the temperance movement? And they get really excited about it. So hopefully they get some of those. Think about it extra hard when you're teaching temperance now. Why? Why it was such a successful successful movement? Um, And so this is interesting too. This is procedural too. When we talk to our students, um, looking at the difference between federal and state responsibility, because here this says promote relief efforts by state and local governments and private charities. And like remember the first one of the first letters I read was from the Red Cross. There's a lot of stuff going on in the country right now. The Dust Bowl. There's not a surplus of food right now. Um, so the the Red Cross is helping to support drought victims, and now we're dealing with groups of people who are unemployed, and so the Red Cross is exhausting their money helping drought victims, and now they're you know, feeling around trying to get help for unemployment. Um, and I like to tell the students that Monopoly was a game that came out around this time period, but the community chest was actually a thing. And in those documents I have for you guys, is the accounting for some of the community chests in some of the big cities and how people could go about getting money from the community chests um, when they needed help to pay their bills. And so the argument that is made in this is instead of providing direct federal relief, we could instead maybe route some emergency funds to private charities and to states, and then they could distribute the money however they saw fit. So, 
if we choose that as an option by promoting state and private charity relief, what are some of the good and bad things that could come out of that? States know their citizens better. That's a good thing with that. I think the argument that they would know what their state needs more than the federal government. Independence. One of the issues would be where you're going to get the money. We're already cutting our spending and taxes. So how is that the federal government wind up giving block grants to the states? You need to have oversight of the money so that a lot of it doesn't go to administrative costs before it actually reaches the recipients. I think there's just too many recipients in some states, you know, like banks. Well, is this would be just too many recipients. The way I, I read this was what? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The way I read this was that it was you're talking about private stuff, not federal government sending money. So in this case here, but the only thing I saw it as being more like the way they did the uh, war food effort kind of a thing. It's using that same philosophy as everybody grows a victory garden, uh, you know, promote everybody helping each other. Federal it's like we're all in this definitely together. definitely being routed to across <coughs> and private groups, even though it wasn't something so much talked about. And I can tell you that Hoover was firmly in favor of people giving to private charities and charities home. Because he did. He thought that rich people were altruistic and that they would see people were suffering and they would give money to these community chests and private charities and it'd be okay. He actually spent a lot of time as president like fundraising for, for private charities essentially. Um, but I mean, yeah, those, that, that, those things are definitely questions like, is it just who's gonna help if everybody's unemployed and everyone is a <laughs> and hungry and, yeah. and needs something. Yeah, doesn't it become so. a dependence issue at that point, then? Is it what? Doesn't it become then a dependence issue? That then they're, that's the only thing they're relying on and they're not ever worried about picking themselves back up because they have that handout. So yeah, can we incentivize people to get them back to work instead of just giving them handouts? Uh, Here. All right, let's look at option two. So option two is looking at more direct uh, relief to the people. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Is this typically how you would run this format, a large group, work through each option? Do you put kids in small groups? You have option one, give me pros and cons. I mean, how do you No, because we this? want them to talk about all the options. So we would work, work it together all in one big group. Um, I try to split the groups into like 25 or less, but you know, sometimes in classes I get 30 students at a time, so. Um, but even in like this format, there'd probably be too many people in like how we would do this with adults for this. But for this instance, it's okay because we're kind of doing the forum and kind of learning from it too. I'm able to kind of give you tips for running it yourself. Um, so yeah, you would do it with the whole class. The downside to having them focus on a group is they or a like one option is they act like the cheerleader for that option and then don't don't even yeah. consider the other options that are up there. So we want them to talk through all of the options and, and be listening. Um, one of the teachers I worked with though made like a worksheet that, because we keep track of everything on, usually we do like either a, like on an easel or I prefer the whiteboard because I can erase and stuff, but some people like the easel option and they stick the options on the walls. Um, but they have the students basically doing the same thing at their seat and tracking themselves what they think are good options and what they think the trade-offs are. So you can kind of work you know, a little bit with it and see what you think will work. But doing it this way I think is good. They have the visual. and Sometimes you forget what you said over here by the time you get to option three. And then we can go back and say, oh, but wait, in option one we said. So it's, it's kind of figuring it out. Uh, for yourself too, what you feel comfortable doing. 
So, and, and in this one, unlike the community one, we do have to kind of give them some historic cues to get them talking. So it's a little bit a step over like the regular uh, moderator role um, because we have to provide context sometimes for some of the things that are in here. So direct relief we're looking at now. Um, what do you guys think for direct relief? What are some of the things that we can do? Federal government could give money directly to charities or can set up uh, relief agencies. Creating safety nets. It's implied yeah. in the preamble, promote the general welfare. So we can make an argument for that if we tell Hoover, like, hey, we should do this, because it says. It's not welfare meaning, uh, at hand, it's welfare meaning the general well-being of the nation. And also with the tone of the government, like, to promote the morale. The site, he is listening, he's here, he does care about you. So what are the trade-offs if we do this? You lose control of that money and there might be graft in the system. Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time to get these set up as well. Yeah, like administration who's in charge. How are they deciding who gets what? Right, because in this, one of the things we say is that it's getting ready to be winter and we need to make some decisions because people are going to be cold and hungry soon. Um, so we need something timely, so that's what I'm thinking about. Um, are there any more trade offs that we can think of for providing um, the safety nets and relief agencies? The duration, cost. Uh, how long? Well, the safety net's more for the future. It doesn't necessarily help out what's going on right now. Yeah, it it's more of a protective, hey, look what we did to make this not happen later. It doesn't necessarily help currently. Well, you could follow Theodore Roosevelt's example with the coal strike where he basically said, you're going to provide coal to the people in the winter. While that's happening, we will solve the problem that's causing the strike. So kind of trying to kill two birds with one stone, we're gonna take an action right now, but while we're taking that action, we are going to solve the problem long term. But who's solving the problem? Is it state, you know, are they gonna- In the case of the coal strike, it was Roosevelt sitting down with the the union people and the coal industry people and saying you will come up with a solution here it's going to happen whether it's to your benefit to their benefit or to my benefit one way or another this is going to occur but is whoever going to listen to every state go to every state listen to every state legislature here's our problem it's just so big you know it's not just like one coal it's quite a bit what other things can we do Um, let's talk about unemployment insurance and old age pensions, because that's one of the options on there. <clears throat> so, old age pensions, unemployment insurance kind of lumped together here, but um, what kind of good things could happen if we if, if the government offers an old age pension, they say at 50, you're out of the workforce because it's 1929, people did not like to be honored. So you're 50, you're out. Um, we remove an entire group of people from the workforce. Um, and for unemployment insurance, we're talking about people who now don't have jobs, now they're getting money for being unemployed and they can presumably cover expenses that they so what are the good things and the bad things that could come from this option? Creates jobs. Mm -hmm. Get to keep your home. And if like, those people that want, if they let go of those jobs, they were not in before, so where's that money coming from? Because that also means that someone is gonna get cheated out of it, like, 
if you've got someone who's, I don't know, 60, it's like, well, do I, do we pay someone who's 60 10 years of back old age pension? So there are some logistics issues of, does someone just get cut out the short stick? And with unemployment, is it how long are they going to get it? Will it? What's going to encourage them to be able to look for a job if they can just keep getting on the system? Plus, the trade off of unemployment insurance that you mentioned earlier was we don't have great data. Hoover doesn't have great data from every state to even know how much to allocate. How much and where is the money coming from? Is that what you're saying? No free Yeah, money. without data sets, how do you know how much to allocate yeah. properly to two people? Are on you have a large liability with both of those around the government's neck for now until forever. It's our money. How long is it going to last? It's such a crazy <laughs> I think during this time period in the world, there was a lot of fear of socialist ideals spreading Communist into America. Yeah. Yeah. So there would have been some resistance at the governmental levels. Good point. Interesting. Yeah, those Bolsheviks just yeah, took over. Good. Yeah, in the teens. So yeah. I should I should put in there. I'll I'll remind myself to do it. I'll add it. So there's a ballot for Hoover in Iowa that we have. Um, where Hoover, on the ballot in Iowa, there was socialist and there was communist that ran against Hoover. People had those options to vote for them uh, in the state of Iowa during the presidential election. There was like six candidates on the presidential ballot, which is fascinating. And great pictures of Hoover coming to Des Moines and Cedar Rapids for talks, too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think... When would the census data be available? <laughs> This is August of 1930, so they're mm -hmm. in the process of doing that. Would it, that have been ready in the fall or winter, or would that have taken a couple of years? How? What's the yeah, it would have taken a while to be compiled. Um, yeah, it was created. Yeah, well, yeah, because it would have been 1930 would have been so the most recent census. Right but a lot of states were doing mid-censuses, like New York did a census in every five years um, on the off of the, the, the big census. So if our census was coming 1930, New York did 1925, because it's such an influx of immigrants, it was the only way they could track the actual population numbers in the state. But not every state was doing that, of course. And then, um, I mean, doing the census back then had its own complications. There was really rural parts of the country. There were still a lot of parts that were reservation lines for Native Americans that they couldn't get onto. Um, so yeah, the census was probably not incredibly accurate data either. We use the farmers' almanac seem to be the most reliable <laughs> <laughs> information in that time, which is funny, but not actually it has really good information. Um, so the other thing it talks about is public works projects. So if, Hoover, if we advise Hoover to initiate public works programs, what are some of the good and the bad things that can come out of those? Or jobs. In construction. public yeah. mean by building whatever mm -hmm. or building. And better infrastructure, like improved uh, roads. Makes people <coughs> feel better about their handouts. And generally better infrastructure means better access to markets. Working that, and I just want to say, just from knowing what's in a lot of those letters, and you might want to pick one to give to your students beforehand. People weren't begging Hoover for handouts, they were begging for jobs. Mm -hmm. And they would say, I don't want money or pity, I want a job, I want to work. So, like, like we were saying about like people feeling better about getting their like handout, that was a real thing. Like they really wanted to work. What are the trade-offs if we go with public works? There's that money then. Raising taxes. <coughs> Money's always the answer. Is it sustainable? What sustainable. else? Employees, whether they're going to be trained or untrained, where you're going to get them from, how do you get them there, how do you put them? 
and if most people were expecting this to be a temporary depression or a panic, it'd be very unlikely that most people would acquiesce to the idea that you're going to spend all this time to set up a program, train people, set up stations. Why yeah. set up a two-year program for a six-month problem? Yeah, how long will they have these jobs before they're once again looking for work? They're not creating long-term, it's short-term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do people have to leave their current job? to get these like public works there. Presumably they're unemployed. Yeah, yeah. Presumably, sorry. As soon as I said that, I was like, that's a dumb <laughs> And they're low paying jobs for them, right? So we're not talking about sometimes even their previous standard of living is less, like better than nothing, but still not good. So there's some, some questions about the public's, public works. Um, and we get some letters from people that come in um, about wanting to do public works and infrastructure projects and not having the things that they need to to do them. Um, but we get a letter also, a telegram comes in from Congress to President Hoover that says, um, we believe that we can, with appropriate legislation and simple administration, a sufficient part of surpluses can be converted into public works programs and that they can actually start um, food relief legislation with that with the public works as well and they said that one of the most important things they need to do is feed destitute families um, and so they're asking for guidance what they should do because they have two things that they can do to start helping people but the president has to sign it and they need to know they have his support so that's one of the things that's coming coming in. So we know Congress is kind of maybe floating around some of these ideas too. Um, and they're really not the president. So we can take that under advisement for when we advise Hoover. On the pro side, did you talk about job skills being learned with the um, well, we put staff recruitment and training. So yeah, I guess the recruitment and training kind of comes on the other side too. They they get to acquire job skills. <clears throat> All right. And also, so you guys know too, this is fascinating information that I've, we've been working on. There are books and books and books of projects that um, Hoover had that they wanted to build uh, different public works projects and they would um, say how much they would cost and then how much construction would cost, how much the land would cost, how much total expenditures would be and then how much money they could make off of the completed public work project. So some of the public works projects like bridges that had tolls would make money and then some public works projects like roads might not make money but might cost upkeep and they also talked about how many people they would need to continue working at that site to upkeep the public works and so when it came time to make decisions they could just go right to these charts and these books and select which public works projects they would want to to select um, it's it was kind of interesting to see our co country's infrastructure broken down like that um, and that's in those documents too. You'll see things that we have now that you can't imagine they didn't exist back in that time. Um, but that was the way they were able to make those decisions. They already did studies. They, we know what we need. We know how much it's going to cost. We know what states they're in. So we could start making decisions on public works based upon information we already have. So if we're talking about speed, that's something that we have access to. Um, in advising Hoover. All right, we're doing awesome. All right, so the third option is to stimulate business. So there's a few different things going on here. Business is different uh, back in Hoover's time than it is now. And I'm sure you guys remember uh, Roosevelt was trust busting and, and they started working on breaking apart a lot of businesses and now it seems that maybe we can make some arguments for 
lessening some of those restrictions and looking at maybe how we've treated businesses and what kind of stuff we can do to get them get them <coughs> doing. So what are some examples of things that we could do to <coughs> stimulate business? Deregulate. We talked about that a little bit over there, but this would be an extreme, uh, or not extreme, a calculated deregulation. That one would be extreme because that is getting government completely out of the economic role. This would be we're deregulating slightly, maybe on things like monopolies. So this is more of a strategic deregulation. <coughs> How else can we deregulate businesses during this time? Is there some other stuff we can do? Protective tariff. We can what? Protective tariff. High tariffs. Are you saying get them or have them or to take them away? Reduce tariffs or increase tariffs? Increase. 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 Economic protection. But would that help? Not for a minute. Not, but we'll be other countries like raise their tariffs. Right. We got them in this condition in the first place. Thank you, America. The consumer's not getting the cheapest option. Consumers. Price of products is going down. Are there more good things that can come from the tariff? Increase government revenue. <coughs> economy is kind of going down the toilet this should help to isolate us from that but it also isolates us from cheaper products mm -hmm. all right so one of the things that's on here this one typically gets a lot of discussion is providing federal loans or grants to support business or industry things that come out of the government providing loans or grants and I know we think about those things separately because loans we expect will be paid back grants are money that we just give away that's not coming back more jobs. we can hire more people or expand invest in <coughs> technologies so I want to read to you guys really quick there is this awesome letter that came in from great northern utilities in chicago and this this man writes to the president he says i have a number of cities under franchise to build gas plants in this vicinity and i'm getting a number more it is my intention to build a hundred plants in this vicinity if i can and i'm trying my utmost to get the work started at once while there's such a crying demand for the use of gas <coughs> and so many people waiting to get something to do, you would think that the 60 to 80 men employed in each town or city where these plants to be installed would be helpful. I am in a market where it's almost impossible to get the financing, and I'm trying to get started by asking material men and builders to cooperate with me and build these plants and wait for their money for as long as six months, giving the bankers time to get in a market where the financing can be done. In this way, I will be giving work to the unemployed at a time that it is mostly needed, as well as getting the plants built at a time that the cost of material and labor is low, and doing a thing that means something to the country and cities from a construction standpoint that leaves a valuable asset in these cities and towns. 
These plants are automatic in operation and low in construction costs. The gas is made from butane and propane oil at a rate that can be made that can be made in the small towns and is equally as low in the large ones. If you have any suggestions to make in the financing of these plants in this market, I would like to hear from you. <laughs> Yours truly, Arthur Smith, Vice President, Engineer, and Manager of Great Northern Utilities. And a lot of these kinds of letters came in. So we have businesses that have franchise contracts, that have workers ready to go, and they know they're gonna make money, they've got a business plan, and they can't get money to finance their projects. So if, um, if the private banks are unable to do it, um, do you think it's worth it for us to advise to President Hoover that we should do federally backed loans or grants to places like Great Northern Utilities in Chicago? You'd need a whole bunch of regulation for that though. Because how do I know that that guy really has all of that set up? That, that's an awful, that letter seems it's bad. It's bad. kind of, I don't know. I want to hire I people. I can build 100 plants. Them. It's ready to happen. Yeah, but I'm not going to pay the workers. I'm creating jobs, but I'm not going to pay them. thought is though. For a while. He said he was going to pay the workers. He was going to be able to pay for buildings and materials. Because Hoover believes in like the noblesse oblige, uh, that the wealthy people will give stuff anyway, I would say that he would be really on board with this idea that like, he could help someone and that this guy's gonna follow through on his word because that's just what a good person does. So what things does the government get back if they provide loans to businesses? Well, it's a loan plus they actually follow through. They should be paid the money, money back mm -hmm. plus interest. A lot of goodwill in those communities. The, the, the federal government, government help. The federal government's just for the <coughs> banks, pretty much. Yeah, They're yeah. taking place of the banks. They'd almost have to run it through a local bank. They, they would need some oversight. Someone on the ground sitting there watching the project come along and check marking whether or not this is actually happening and if it's meeting certain timelines and deadlines. Guarantee the loan as the opposed to uh, oversight, yeah. guarantee a bank loan as opposed to giving them the, the business the money, they give the bank the money and let the bank or oh, yeah. provide the bank uh, some kind of. Then the banks, if that's right. a bank that failed already, who's to say they're not, you know, they're going to have to. But maybe the debt's, well, that's a way of providing money to the banks then too. Mm -hmm. You're pushing money into the bank just like you're providing money to any business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which business do you do? Do you do the electric yeah, company or you do the bank? Mm -hmm. Bank might be the better way to go. Yeah, at least they're professionals in the field. And then they also can do oversight because mm -hmm. they might have some skin in the game. And they've done it before and they know which companies. If right. not Great Northern, maybe somebody else is doing the exact same thing. Did you, as an aside, did you say you have documentation and primary sources for each of these options? Is that how you broke it out? It's like here, this option has these primary sources to argue back and forth. This one has this, this one has this. Um, we have seen like the totality of the documents. But they're not really broken out by And option. then had to work through and, and kind of sort them into that, that idea of tension. Like um, we can't tell the president we're going to reduce spending and balance the budget and provide old patents, pensions, and um, um, unemployment insurance. So we're going to provide, you know, we're going to cut taxes, but then we're also going to provide grants to struggling businesses. So we had to kind of find where it made sense to kind of chop it up. Um, but they were all yeah, actually one. presented to, to <laughs> your different times, which is insane. I mean, and there was more than just this. <laughs> there was a lot of information to take in. And something else about presidential records that uh, that is helpful in knowing when we put this together. Um, Richard Nixon was a fantastic president that was honest and caused no concern about his documents when he was leaving office. So much so that the Supreme Court passed an emergency act called the Presidential Papers Act and everything from Nixon forward, any documents created in the White House belong to the people immediately when the president leaves office. So like while Obama was moving out of the White House, the National Archives had been on site for months collecting servers, documents, um, everything. And there's already like fail safes built in. So every time an email is sent, it's already on record at the National Archives. But before Nixon, 
such as the case with Hoover, um, he was able to hire staff to go through all of his papers and call the things they didn't want us to see. And then he donated what was he felt good about. So we may not even have the complete historic record of what was coming into President Hoover. Um, and even Hoover divided some of his papers up. So some of them are in West Branch and some of them are at the Hoover Institute in uh, Stanford in California. Um, and like Woodrow Wilson's papers are divided up. Some are in Princeton and some are some other state. And so the presidential papers are kind of scattered, especially when you get like behind, just behind Hoover. Like Coolidge's papers are kind of a mess. So it's presidential history has suffered from not having that act in place. Um, that's why everyone makes a big deal. Like social media is still new to presidential libraries. Even digital documents are still in the scope of history, very new. And in order to release presidential papers, like they talk about, um, like they want to declassify so many documents, and people get mad at the archives for not doing it. But what happens is everything that comes in from the president is classified because it's all national security. So there's declassification teams that have to read each individual email, scratch pad, anything that comes out of it. And if it doesn't contain classified information, they can declassify it immediately. If it's questionable, it has to go back to the agency that it came from and be declassified from them and then filtered back through declassification. And that can be an email from someone that says, yes, thank you, see you at 6 o'clock. So it's a long process to get presidential papers kind of undone. And so when we were doing the Clinton issues guides, theirs first one is on Kosovo. All of the documents are still classified. So it was hard to write. <laughs> they were using like CNN footage and stuff like that. So um, it's interesting just looking at the massive difference from Hoover and being able to have access to all of his documents, I mean, that we have, compared to, say, Clinton, who we can't access any of the documents yet. Um, and even, even like George Bush's library is closed up tight because they have, they're all digital, at least Clinton's, a lot of them are paper, so they can review them and, and do them right away. But the process for a digital document is that it has to be printed before it's officially a document and then declassified. Because technology moves so quickly that we have to digitally migrate everything. Think about Word, things that were written in Word when Clinton was president, you cannot open those now. So they have to be printed because 50 years from now, you may have no tools for accessing those documents. Um, and paper, we've been saving for thousands and thousands of years. Digital documents, not so much. So it's been a, an interesting process for learning about records keeping for um, <laughs> Do you commit everyone. them to paper and then, put, then digitize them so people can access them? With paper stuff, the, so the National Archives has set themselves a lofty goal of 100% digitization. I don't expect anyone will see that in their great-grandchildren's lifetimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but most stuff is digitally born now, so it'll be easier to start searching stuff, I think, as time moves on. It's the declassification <coughs> that holds access to documents up. And in fact, one of the cool things that I think is coming out of the Obama papers, the lesson is that they're already and have been all along actively declassifying things. So as soon as they open the online library, there's already going to be documents populated and available. So it's learning lessons. What about the Hillary stuff? The well, emails, etc. Well, her papers et don't belong. Well, the State Department. State Department stuff. With, um, with him, yeah, they'll belong to, well, they might belong to the State Department, not the National Archives. It depends on what the interactions were with the president, too. But um, yeah, that'll be interesting. And even things like social media now is all official records. So when things get deleted, the archivist of the United States gets really upset and has to go in and have a talk with people about deleting social media. So um, it's everyone's still learning about how this all works and what we should be preserving as national records. Twitter must drive them crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bad. And then, like, I don't know who made bad, but they started FOIA requesting our Twitter handlers. 
I don't know. So, yeah, uh, access to the records complicates this, but I mean, because we had so much easy access and they already, people have been working in Hoover's records since probably the 30s, and then they were brought over to West Branch in the 50s, and they spent about a decade sorting and organizing them. And then in 63, the library opened, and since 63, they've gone through several reshuffles and resorting and organizing to align with the new National Archive standards. So they're so easy to search. We have finding aids for everything. So it made getting into these documents really, really easy, but still a very onerous process because like letters to Hoover requesting um, assistance is like 10 boxes of documents, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I promise you it's a lot. Like just that right there is maybe a quarter of a folder, and that's what we needed to write the guide. But we had to go through so much, and a lot of it was repetitive. But yeah, so we actually went with actual suggestions from people. And it was funny because we sat down and just from our head, like with the regular guide, we're like, well, what do we think we would want? Well, we think we'd want these things, and we kind of shuffled them around. And then when we got into the documents, got more insight to what people at that time needed and um, found out we weren't very far off from each other. And to find out, like you can imagine making ends meet when I get AP students that come in, we do making ends meet first, and then we do this, and they're like, whoa, things haven't changed very much. It's like, I know, right? So <laughs> um, it's interesting to see that kind of perspective that we're still struggling with. How do we provide social safety nets and relief to people who are Americans and Anyway, it's interesting. So loans and grants. Okay. So we kind of hit on this with the antitrust stuff. Um, and it's safe to assume during Hoover's time, deregulating monopolies was still new. So if you were alive to think back to when like Carnegie and Ford were thriving and people were getting cars and stuff like that and that wasn't so far off in the past, do you think maybe there's like a, uh, maybe a wish to go back to that time because people saw that as the time under Coolidge where we were thriving? And so like what, what kind of good things could come out of reversing some of those antitrust regulations? Sky's the limit. They can do anything. And buy all competitors and create the biggest business with those guys they want. Free market. Yeah. Total laws in there. And prices were actually so like standard oil was a monopoly. Mm -hmm. Kerosene was actually cheaper than when it came after they were busted up. <coughs> yeah, he knew to keep demand high was to keep the price down. Are there any other good things that could come out of it other than nostalgia? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're it is being bought out, you have an increase in the industry, then you might have more jobs. Yeah. And, uh, standardization might mean you have a better service. What are some of the not great things that can come out of the antitrust laws? Business or more important than money. They can also hoard supplies. Mm -hmm. Do it yeah, Hold on to different supplies. Yeah. 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 If you've got a monopoly, you just say you can't just skyrocket the price and say. One industry yeah. can corner the market on, say, steel or iron, and another one can't get it. So um, the workers? Do I know what's happening? You stifle innovation on the newer show. It'd be too hard to break in without a lot of people in general. And the workers, too, because you can really treat your workers any way you want, and then you have the rise of unions, which led to like the coal strike. things on here is to 
increased needle smell. And I don't know how deep you guys got into the writing, but or uh, the reading, but we, um, the United States, had signed <coughs> some um, international treaties saying that we were not going to expand our naval department and that we were actually going to work on disarming some of our uh, Navy. <coughs> um, and so, of course, there's a, a fallout for that. And this is a letter from um, Hoover's Naval Secretary, the, the Department of Navy, because this was when we still had the Department of Navy and the Department of the Army and did not have a Department of Defense yet. Um, he wires the president that the press carried the report that the Secretary of Navy is reducing naval personnel by 4,800 men in order to adjust the Navy to the limitations of the London Naval Treaty. Feels that the distress caused by unemployment is incalculable and adding to this condition would be most deplorable. Hope some method may be devised whereby this cutting down can be postponed. Um, and he's asking if, uh, let's see, if no men are to be discharged from the Navy, uh, can we just, or if we don't discharge them under law, but the proposal is merely to gradually slacken enlistment until the Navy is in balance with the program. So they're in saying instead of firing everybody, let's slowly let people out because the, un the cost of unemployment is really, really great. And this, by the way, he's only talking about in Brooklyn, New York. This is just one city. And it, it was happening all over the country, but this is just an example of what that was like when that came in and the effects on just one small city in New York. So naval, when we talk about building stuff for the Navy, just for some context, we're talking about building um, very large structures that are very expensive and sometimes take a long time to build um, and a lot of labor and manpower to build them. So if we decide to advise President the, to advise President Hoover that we're going to increase naval spending, what are some of the good things that can come out of that? We'll retain jobs. What else? Greater national defense and projection of power. Reasserting our growth in the international like the view. Increased confidence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Putting us right along the Modernize. This is when you're converting from coal to fuel oil. You get all modern battleships, and maybe some of them don't blow up the Pearl Harbor the way they did. Are there trade offs to? Increasing our naval spending? Reaction foreign countries. We're violating treaties. Guns are fired. If we increase <laughs> naval spending, well, that's. Where's it coming from? Yeah, we coming? can't increase relief to uh, our citizens. Sorry, Billy, you don't get to eat. You yeah. gotta build a battleship. It really only helps the coasts. Kind of leaves the dust bowl farmers. Great Lakes, too. Well, that's a long way from all the North Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota. You're going to start an arms race. Would we, though? Like, were other countries wealthy enough to even compete with America? The Japanese were at that time. Yeah. I think they had a fleet in the early 30s. The Germans will take the German and the are doing the same thing. They're not going to come to power yet, though. Yeah, they're all fighters, but the Japanese are doing this lease. They were starting to violate the treaty. But Japan was all, Japan's actions, they believed they were upholding the Washington naval restrictions. What about the British? I did. I'm sure that they would have kicked in the same way. If you start seeing America start doing this, everyone else is going to start doing it. Everyone else is going to, what are they doing? And then. Maybe you pull those countries out of depression too. Yeah, not necessarily a bad thing. To have an arms race to a certain degree. To a certain degree. I mean, yeah. considering it was only like uh, <laughs> <laughs> considering the past <laughs> race to the top. Uh, <laughs> looking back on it, Hitler was was building away, yeah. and everyone else was just you know 
Sit tight. Yeah. So let's kind of wrap it up and, and look at uh, look at our options here. We ended up talking about a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of different ways that we think that we can deal with unemployment. Obviously, um, Hoover has a lot of options presented to him from trustworthy sources, Congress, um, uh, other engineers, and some of the stuff that we learned is that uh, Congress is willing to convene a special special session under under Hoover because they want to work on this. We know the data is kind of sketchy. Um, this is, and for instructors, we don't typically do this in the other one, but for this one I like to do with students. Um, take a temperature of the room and see what option you would vote for if you had to vote right now to take them to Hoover. If you would vote for option one, raise your hand. Okay, we would go for option two, raise your hand. Okay. Option three. So at least there's a good division. But can you see where students now are like, all of the options suck? <laughs> they all suck. Like no one is, we're not going to do like great for everybody no matter what we do, um, although we can try. Do you let them pull their own together? Like maybe this, some no, from A, some from B, some from C? So that's, what, that's where I typically go next. So what I want us to do is kind of have some discussion about if we were going to kind of piecemeal something together to take back to President Hoover to advise him, knowing that we're going to have to work within the confines of a national budget um, and the Constitution, um, what things do you think we would choose from these options to take back to Hoover and let's talk about why. And so if you disagree, this would be a good time for us to get going. But let's look at option one. If we were going to pick some things for option one, all of it, some of it, what do you think we should start with? Absolutely repeal the 18th Amendment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Get it gone. Mm -hmm. Start rebuilding that bus those businesses. So we can look at repealing the 18th Amendment. Does anybody disagree with that? Yeah, to a degree. Okay. <laughs> okay. I would like to see some kind of national what? taxation what? on alcohol. Then. Okay, and I think those are the things laid out. Yeah. But we know this is going to take a long time. So can, would you be in favor of telling the president, like, we'd like to start the process of talking to Congress and having a conversation about repealing it? Put, put, in the, put in the repealing language that there will be a national taxation on it, and I'm all for it. That it, it will be, it, that you can buy it and sell it, but the proceeds are taxed, and that tax goes to funding some of these relief programs. Then I'm on board 100%. And so if we do that, we can look at, if we're looking at the confines of the budget, right, <coughs> that um, we're going to reduce the cost of law enforcement because that's a big expense to us and, and having the FBI and chasing these um, you know, uh, mafia guys around. And then we're going to move some of this money from the black market into the regular market. Hopefully, that will stimulate more of this national tax that we would agree to. So I think that we can um, tell the president like we can find ways for this to support other things that we might be in favor of. Is there anything else? in option one that you think that we should keep to take back to President Hoover, or maybe we could put it on the bike rack to talk about it? The private charities, giving money to private charities. In the st I like the private I've charities. I've always felt like a state, especially local, knows what their people need. Like you said, the Dust Bowl is one place. Then Brooklyn, New York is totally different. And Red Cross, Salvation Army, and the YMCA, they know what their community needs more than Washington, D.C. So we can I mean, we can talk about that through other options, too, that we should talk about whether these things should be regulated, like at the state level or at the national level, so we can gauge um, where that need is. Um, what about option two? Um, are there things we should take to President Hoover from option two, things that we should leave out? I like some sort of direct relief back to the individual. The question is how much could you do that without sacrificing 
the function of government. Well, there any agencies you're talking about? Like maybe providing food or or what about pensions and unemployment insurance? Well, I like the idea of the public works because then you're getting infrastructure or something for the money you're giving and there is that point of pride. So it, it's government aid, but you're getting something in return. There's, it's not necessarily like strings attached, but you're getting work out of what you're giving. And remember we said when we were looking at it, there's already the public works projects have already been studied. They already have estimates. We can kind of pull from those quickly and get people to work if you know we're pressed for time. Um, that might be a good option to kick back to Hoover. And they um, can provide a long-term return on investment. Yeah. So they're a sellable idea. But did we have documentation from Congress that they would support them? One of the letters we did have from them said that they would be um, interested in public works projects because they thought it would be a good way to get people back to work. I'd imagine it'd be really easy to get Congress. It's like which state gets which money, and it's like anything I can do to bring my gravy, you know, the the Christmas tree. It's like here, you do this, you do this, and I brought this money back to my district. Pork barrel spending. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Term. So, is there anyone that's against the idea of taking public works as a suggestion to Hoover? <coughs> Um, what about the old age pensions or unemployment insurance? I, I like the old age pensions just to remove them from the job market, to get them out of, to not have to worry about that being employed. And the money we get from the liquor, we can get for the old people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That'll provide the revenue. <laughs> tax okay. And I'll give them something to do in retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Drink themselves. <laughs> what about unemployment insurance? Is that something we're interested in advising Hoover to move forward with? Is anyone against the old age pensions? Well, my question is, we're in the early part here, mm -hmm. and how comfortable are we to uh, go away from balancing the budget and go into deficit spending? That's a huge question, because mm -hmm. all these things yeah. are gonna, you know, in hindsight, you know, of course it's normal for us to do that now, but back then, well, but was it the last time the U.S. government was out of debt was like during the Jackson administration? Uh, so it's yeah, not but, like that's something that's unknown. But yeah. but it's mainly because of wars. The debt goes up because of war, and then we always start paying it back. Well, kind it's of not a, normal something taxed to so go into deficit spending for things like fixing the economy. That's and that's well, something we of. kind of hit on, that there's this indefinite government liability if we yeah. sign people up for old age pensions. Yeah. So maybe we'll put that in the parking lot and look back at it. What about the relief agencies and safety, like the social safety nets? If we talk about like um, things like food relief, like the congressman said there are surpluses. If we, you know, we could put people to work getting those surpluses spread out and getting people fed, um, should we maybe talk about safety nets with President Hoover? Or I, I think if we're going with the old age pensions, I think a natural uh, complement to that is the relief agency or safety net. So if we're talking about like helping a specific group of people in the country, people of a certain age or unemployed, I don't know how strong the argument is that you can make to say, well, we're only going to help some people but not other people. But I think the unemployment, or not the unemployment, the retirement insurance, you're taking an entire generation out of the workforce mm -hmm. and allowing a younger generation or two younger generations to come into the workforce. So you're opening the jobs up. I mean, well, we can't look to now. Never mind. Yeah. I said, well, you look at 2008. That's why it was harder yeah. for people to get jobs because boomers stayed in the market yeah, they, they had to because, because their retirement was collapsed. Yeah. It's the same reason I can't yeah. find volunteers for the museum. It's the working people. <laughs> 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 it's funny, but it's true. <laughs> I like the idea of safety. It's food, money to food kitchens or soup kitchens. Um, well, there you're helping not only the people who are poor, but you're helping, you're getting the produce bought. Yeah, they're and from you're local. doing something with a yeah. surplus, so it's it's not just helping. Hey, we're helping this one person. It's, it's the you're helping everybody yeah. around in this. Mm -hmm. 
So is there anybody that does not want to tell uh, President Hoover that we should invest in relief agencies? Maybe with a limitation on it, it's not going to be forever. To go too far into debt. Yeah. Deficits, but in the yeah. back of the mind. So we can do it, but we can tell him that we want to see time limits on it to prevent too much deficit spending. Um, so we can mark that down to... to Connect it with the public works option. As you get more and more people on the public works programs building things, there should be less people getting safety net assistance. Mm -hmm. So right. couple those together and you might have your problem, problem solved. So if we move on to option three, are there any parts of option three that you guys would like to keep? There were some people that voted for option three, so this is your spotlight time to tell why we should keep certain parts of this. The loans to business. So loans to businesses. So Using that as, along with the public works, you're able to pump money into the economy. Okay. Um, and can we, can we do public works if we can't get materials from businesses that can't get loans? Um, is that something we have to think about their relationship to each other maybe? Um, is there anyone against the idea of providing businesses with loans? What about grants? Do you think we should provide businesses with grants? No. So is there anyone that thinks that we should provide businesses with grants? I like loans better do. than grants. Yeah. Depends what they do. Are they coal? Are they gas? Like, is it a necessity? You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe. Gr how about grants that go toward the public works area? Yeah. It's like we'll give you money for this business if you're providing a public good as opposed to a private good. So, do we want to tell Hoover that um, we want to put a provision in for regulating grants to public good or? The public consumption. Necessity. Can they do a, a given whole loan necessity. where if they achieve such a goal, they don't have to pay back all or part of it? You can build a power plant, but you have to charge X amount. You know, reduced amount, or you pay it back with subsidies to people that, you know, they get free electricity, or not free electricity, but they get a reduced rate on electricity for X amount of money, X amount of time. Overhead to create. Are we, are we partially dipping our toes into socialism? I was there? just going to say yeah. that, like, I said, I'm not saying they'll pass Congress. I'm saying that's my first option. If you want the benefits of uh, of a grant without the baggage, what, why not just cut okay. their taxes? The businesses. Well, I would. I mean, is it enough? Are taxes enough to provide people with what they need to build power plants? Like the guy from Chicago was saying, how much are we talking here? Uh, yeah. Are we talking big? Are, we talking are you increasing the tax? Yeah, it's like, well, we'll reduce your taxes if you do this particular thing. All of a sudden, you're carving out tax breaks, and all of a sudden, the tax code is going to balloon to, you know, Where you have thousands of pages as opposed to hundreds of pages. There are farmers that are going to lose their farm because their taxes are too high. It's like, why a business over a farmer? Picking winners and losers. Yeah. So this is where we get to prioritize our decision making. <laughs> so oh, we have, we, I kind of put this in the parking lot because we were talking a lot uh, kind of back, the old age pensions and loans and grants to businesses because you heard at first we were like, yes, let's do it. And it's like, well, then there's this. And then it's like, oh, maybe it's not a great idea. So we need to look back at that because now we're prioritizing our winners and losers. So um, in the old age pensions, we are going to say that this whole group of older people, whether they were employed or not, now receives a federal pension check and they can go off and retire. And that might be to the detriment of other people who need benefits. Um, but we decided the trade off to that was we're removing all these older people from the job market and we're able to usher in younger people who are unemployed so we might be able to stabilize employment. 
with the loans and grants we're looking at, okay, well now we can start building stuff. It's probably a good complement to public works, but could we do it another way with taxes or tax cuts, but then tax cuts have their own problems? Um, or are we giving money to businesses over farmers? Are we giving money to businesses over maybe school children that need food? Um, we have to decide, you know, we have to tell Hoover what, what to decide because there are going to be people who lose and people who win in this decision. The question is, um, I guess, do we want to go with effect or do we want to go with immediate assistance? We have to weigh our options. So for the old age pensions, um, is, there, is there anybody that can say, like, why we maybe shouldn't advise Hoover to do that? Are we shouldn't do the old age pensions? Yeah. Well, you just got a, a liability, and then especially right at the beginning, it's an unfunded liability. <coughs> so could we put a provision in it that it has an expiration date as well? Mm. That could cause problems down the line. Is there a way that we could present this to that would kind of like deal with people? Like the old people did with their younger children. <laughs> well, I mean, we don't have nursing homes what or I things like that. that. And if the older, the children are working, the adult children are working, it's not going to take care of everybody, but it's a lot cheaper than... What's good about the old age pension? It would apply, hopefully, to women and African Americans who are not getting hired. and. That kind of does help a lot more people. Because I know with public works, they had the stipulations that they had to hire African Americans in there. So at least that would cover everybody. Is everyone eligible for the old age pension, even if you were not in the workforce? That's a great well, question. What should we tell Hoover about that if we decide to advise him that? Well, what about a woman whose husband left her? Well, no, but you truth, know, it's true. It's true. We should tell Hoover to take there becomes another data problem in this film because if you don't know how many people are unemployed, then, and there's no, I mean, the income tax at this point is what the top one, I mean, like half of the top one percent or something, I think. And so it's next to nobody that's paying tax, the income tax. So, what record do you use to show that this person actually did work in there for? And most women are hospitals. Yeah, so, and what do you consider that? To be? Well, there were no income taxes at that time. Well, I thought Unless, we had a federal income tax for just a higher. Uh, yeah, I believe it was Carnegie that had his own tax bracket. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. Right. Yeah. There was a tax bracket just for him. Um, so, yeah, but most people were not paying uh, income yeah. tax. Most people are not. So it is hard to keep records of that. And I mean, we, the census would come out and then we'd be able to decide maybe how many people are over the age limit and like setting that age limit. So do you think maybe it's something like we don't want to advise at this time, but maybe it's something we can ask President Hoover to look into with new census data and as maybe a future safety net? It's, it just, well, it's, it's such a big deal. Like we're still early, it's not the great refreshing yet. Yeah, it's, it's kind of so early. It's like we're changing a whole system here. But we're trying to prevent the great depression. <laughs> right. So right. right. You, know, you, know, people are you don't prevent <laughs> something with like something that's so unknown. It's brand new um, that could totally backfire. How I, I don't know, but I would advise them to look at. Okay, Germany's been doing this. Great Britain's been doing this. How is it working for them? What's the downsides? My worry would be if you don't get the young people employed very quickly, you can look to the 1780s. And 1917, and then the weird mark of the Republic mm -hmm. as yeah. to what's going to happen to your government very soon. Yeah. Yeah. And it's already happening as, as Hoover Towns are popping up. So we need to get the old folks out because they're not going to be able enough to fight a revolution to overthrow us. But the young yeah. people will be. That's really, that is a real issue. <laughs> yeah. That is very that's true. I mean, that's what standard. Well, it's don't forget the bonus march happened on the yeah, Hoover yeah, too. Yeah, so yeah. it was a real, like, scary threat. Um, so maybe it's something we can, like, talk to Hoover about and 
and maybe feel out what he's thinking. Maybe we can discern a little bit to his wisdom. But maybe we can tell him we totally thought it up on our own and that he should give us credit for it if he chooses to do it. <laughs> Let's look back at the loans and grants to businesses. Um, is there a reason, is there like a strong reason that we should tell Hoover that we should utilize this option? Jobs. It will create jobs. And it will, if they expand, it will create more and more jobs. And it'll put fluidity in the market. It'll, it'll get money moving throughout the yeah. market. And that's truly what the letters were saying, was we want to work. Mm -hmm. Then you're meeting what appears to be the most immediate need. Is there anyone that's against us advising to Hoover that we need to provide loans and grants to businesses? Calvin Coolidge might not. I mean, he might famously the business of America is business, and he by this point is ha if I recall correctly, he's got a pretty influential newspaper column that he's writing every every week. He gets wind of his successor, one of his successors doing something like that. He might really have a problem with that, and some of the old guard Republicans might have a problem with that too. Maybe, but I mean, like we're still getting the letters from Congress too. Like we've got to fix this. Yeah. Um, it's kind of desperate sounding. Um, I mean, this guy had said it was the worst he'd seen in 12 years as being a member of Congress, which is Hoover and Coolidge's presidency going back, and you know, into Harding's. So he's seen, he's seen some stuff. At least we can rely on. So I, I think that we could convince Hoover to get support for it if it's bad enough? Do you guys think it's bad enough yet? Or do you think maybe we could tell Hoover, like if it gets worse, they can think about doing that? We need to lower the interest rate too. We need to tell the Fed to lower the interest rate to make it easier for people to Yeah, it could be extremely low. low. The interest, it could be even no interest. They just have to pay it back. It's just to get that money exists. moved. Isn't that the, the loans and grants that we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the Fed Power Reserve. FDIC was a new deal gig, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the FDIC is not around yet. And that was part of the problem. Banks didn't have money, and they weren't, it wasn't insured, so they were just lending it. Fed there was not great. You can't just tell Fed what to do. And, and well, yeah. And, Does the Fed exist back then? And they're partially yeah. to blame for this. Yes, the Federal Reserve exists. <laughs> um, but we can set the interest rate on these loans if they're coming out of the federal government. Um, the reserve isn't going to have control over that. And, and especially if we get it down into the banks, too, then the federal government would still have some oversight of it. I think some of it would go to the reserve, too. But do you think that it's desperate enough and that the time is pressing enough that we should advise who to do that? One of the things you keep bringing up is the question of whether or not it's serious enough to do that, is that we're at the beginning of the stages, but most of the programs that we're taking forward to Uber are all relief. Yeah. And we define Mellon. We like to say that um, it, it's not a crisis when it doesn't affect you yet. It's a crisis when all of a sudden it affects you. And that's when the cabinet was like, oh, <laughs> There's a real problem going on because their own personal accounts who are being affected by it. And this is just on the brink of that time where they're starting to feel the effects of what's happening. So it's almost a crisis. And just a note for you guys to know too, that they actually called this the, a depression back then. They were afraid to call it a panic because that invoked some not great memories, right? And. Um, now when we've had a recession, we didn't want to call it a depression because that invokes bad memories. So we just keep uh, finding different synonyms for what we're actually going through, but they actually called it a depression. And you can look at the marketing from the time to see depression era sales and last chance to get this at depression prices and stuff like that. And, uh, now we look back and we're like, wow, that was kind of awful. But um, that was how they discussed it with each other. So, do you think we should um, tell Hoover yes on the private loans, or the um, federal loans to businesses? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 
now we can flip into, in our sheets, what did President Hoover actually do? So I can tell you as an abridged quickie version that um, Hoover started off uh, strongly in favor of allowing the market to self-correct under the advisement of Andrew Mellon. Um, and he really truly believed that this was something that would resolve itself. And he also thought that people would be generous like him and donate money to charities as they needed it. But he started some different commissions to try to address this. One was called Peace, one was called Poor, but he notably um, omitted some people from the, um, those commissions. The NAACP at different times had written him letters, and these are in the documents you can find in, in the folder in, in Doc's Teach, where they said that cities that had high populations of African Americans were being disproportionately affected by unemployment, there was a rise in crime and uh, social problems, and that it was imperative that they got somebody who was a person of color onto the commission to help address the issues that were unique, uniquely happening in predominantly African American cities. Hoover never replied, and he never put anybody that was a person of color on any of the commissions. And not because Hoover was a Quaker, so it was not it really in him to be racist and Lou Hoover actually formally desegregated the White House, but what he was following was status quo, and I think he was really inter afraid of interjecting race into an issue that he felt was economic, and even though there was overlapping, I don't think that there was room in the conversation at that time to address things that were uniquely African American. They would have never thought to have done that in 1929, and it really impaired some cities like Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C., St. Louis was on the list. And I mean, they had lists of cities that really needed to be addressed, um, and they ignored that. But the commissions, the Peace and Poor Commissions, were volunteers. They were people who were really well known in the communities, and they started a lot of unemployment drives and um, charity drives to get money in. So they did do that. They did try to get private money into charities. Hoover worked really hard on that. Um, in 32, he did establish the um, Reconstruction Finance Corporation that did start lending money to um, banks and or to um, businesses. But by then, it was already getting too late to kind of solve the issue. He was on the way out. Um, but that really was started with him, and he was really dedicated to that. Um, they did start setting up nationwide direct relief programs, um, but through the state governments. So Congress passed a law saying that they would set up an unemployment insurance board at the national level. And in that, those folder, or the folder you guys have online, Hoover wrote to his attorney general and said, I don't know if this is constitutional or not, should I sign this? And his attorney general wrote back and said, it is not constitutional. This is the case saying why. This is a power that's reserved to the states. If you sign it, it's just going to cause a whole bunch of court cases and a lot of money spent. You're better off silently vetoing this bill. And so that's what Hoover um, did. He vetoed that bill. Um, things started to look a little bit better, and then they got worse again, of course. The 18th Amendment was repealed, but not under Hoover. Uh, fun fact, the Republicans and the Democrats were labeling their uh, candidates dry candidates or wet candidates, and Hoover was dry, although I think reluctantly, it was a big issue in 1928 if your candidate was wet or dry. Um, it cropped up again in 32, and the Democrats promised to repeal it right away, and they made good on that promise, um, but they also simultaneously banned the cell, uh, and they criminalized um, marijuana. So there was a little bit of a trade on that too. It was not illegal up until that point. So some interesting things that happened in the Democratic National Convention over um, alcohol. The safety nets and stuff of course came about later. But Hoover did start a lot of the um, public works projects. The Tennessee Valley Authority or what would become the TVA. Um, Hoover had started for uh, the country, and he was also the one that grabbed the infrastructure projects for 
the Golden Gate Bridge, and um, some more of the electric infrastructure that came through the Hoover Dam area, and of course, ended up getting the, getting the dam name, the Hoover Dam. So he sampled from all of these things. The tariff, of course, was very contentious in the first time. The tariff caused a lot of economic problems, but that was that actually predated a little bit of this time. But it gave him authority to manipulate the tariff without congressional approval, and so he did. He took full advantage of that. Um, obviously, it got worse. It got even worse under Roosevelt, and then it finally started to get better. But there's a great uh, timeline here talking about the different pieces. Those documents are online. Thank you guys for joining me. I'm doing a full day of Vice the President at NCSS. I suggest not coming to that, or you will be bored out of your mind. Thank you guys want, so you can take one of the modern issue guides as well. They're up there on the table if you are interested in having one of those.